So random fun fact, just to kind of prime the pump, get the message started today. Did you know that years ago when scientists uh, first began making and kind of you know, figuring out the concept of snake antivenom, um, that they used the blood of horses for this. The reason is, is that naturally horses, they obviously they're encountering snakes uh, in the wild, and uh, because of their size, they have more blood, which is able to fight off the venom, and their immunity, their, their immune system produces uh, anti-venom. And so they were using the blood of horses. Um, but over time, what they discovered was that sheep are much better at creating antibodies. Now stop and think about that for a minute. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood um, from what he has made um, so that people are without excuse. Uh, in other words, God reveals himself in his creation. This is the idea, right? And this is an example of that. Listen, here it is. The blood of the lamb is the anti-venom against the serpent's bite. Isn't that amazing? Man, I just, I, th I just thought that's so great. I read it to Brenda. She goes, I'm gonna steal that. I'm like, not unless you're preaching before Sunday, you ain't. <laughs> But uh, here in our text today, and this is why I use this as an intro to it, this fact that there is a serpent's bite that has infected all mankind. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Every last human being on the earth is living under a death sentence spiritually. And this is why Paul has traveled here in our text a thousand miles through Asia Minor, across the Aegean Sea, and now into uh, the continent of Europe because the whole world has been envenomated by the serpent's bite. And Paul has the antidote. Acts chapter 16, we're gonna pick it up in verse nine, um, and we read this. A vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Last week, if you were with us, you know that we explored the idea of responding to God's no's and responding to God's goes, right? He'll tell us no from time to time. We're like, man, God didn't answer my prayer. No, he answered it. You just didn't like the answer. It was no, right? So how do we respond to God's no's? How do we respond to God's goes? And how do we deter, d discern the voice of the Holy Spirit along the way? That was the focus of our message last week. And we focused on how God led Paul and his team in their proclamation of the gospel with God leading first with a couple of no's and followed then by a very clear go that's here in our text in the form of this supernatural vision that Paul received. And so they hopped on a boat. They headed west towards Macedonia. They landed in Neapolis. And from there, they traveled inland to Philippi, which is where we find them uh, today. Now, Philippi, understand a little history about Philippi. It was the foremost city of that part of Macedonia. It was, you might call it Rome away from Rome. Um, it was named after Philip II. He is the father of Alexander the Great. And Philip made Philippi into a fortress and into a capital of his growing kingdom because it was very strategically located. See, it was located on the eastern end of a major highway called the Ignatian Way. 
And merchants and Roman army used this highway um, to carry goods and supplies um, between the eastern part of the empire and the capital city of Rome to the west. So um, very, you know, well fortified. As a matter of fact, what Rome would do is they would tell uh, retiring Roman soldiers, hey, if, uh, if you go and, um, and if you um, retire in Philippi, then we won't, we won't tax you, you know, for, for, your, for your now income, right? We're not gonna, we won't tax you there. Uh, but why? Because they, they wanted to have, you know, it's built as a fortress. They've got, you know, Roman soldiers there, certainly, but they're all, but it's, you know, it's spread out. It's very east of Rome, you know, the capital city of Rome. Um, and so they, they're like, well, we, we just want it well fortified. So the, this, was, uh, this was how it was stabbed, very much a Roman colony. Um, and that's what the text means when, when it uh, identifies um, this as, uh, as a colony. It says that it was a foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, right? A Roman colony is the idea. Now, what Paul's doing here is he's establishing a pattern, right? And he has this established pattern. He's just following it. And we saw this pattern manifested uh, on his first missionary journey as well. What's he doing? He, his pattern is that he seeks to plant churches in major cities. Um, why? Because Paul knew that it was the best way for the gospel to spread, that he would go into a, a large metropolitan city, which was a, itself a melting pot of diverse cultures, and it was also a place where people are coming and going, and what this would do is it would facilitate import and export, which is a natural product of every major city with good traffic, right? with good international traffic, import, export. And he's like, I'm going to import and export the gospel. So that's what Paul would do. Now, here's the thing. We, we need to understand this concept because, I mean, that's not to say that we don't plant churches in small towns. It's not to say you know, that, that the only place where ministry takes place is in a large city, but it's bigger than that. Um, and I'll explain it this way. Um, as many of you know, my son was an actor in Hollywood um, from a very young age. He just, you know, for whatever reason, God opened these doors. Um, he gifted him in it, um, and he blessed him with tremendous success. So he, we were very active in Hollywood for, for a very long time. And as Christians, we took a lot of heat for my kids being involved in Hollywood, my, my daughters did it a little bit. My son really did it a lot, right? And, um, and so, so we, you know, people, they, they see all the news and they think, you know, that, you know, people are freebasing on the set and doing cocaine and just, you know, whatever. And they don't understand that the set is a business. It's just, it's very much professional atmosphere. Um, and, you know, there's nothing taking place that is, is compromising my son. But people would have this attitude of how can you be a Christian and go into such a horrible industry, right? And, and the concept is one of isolation versus infiltration, right? And so our attitude was, look, the last time I checked, you actually have to go into the field to reap a harvest, right? Um, that's Greg Laurie quote. And... and so we see Hollywood as a mission field. Uh, my son's production company, we named it Hard Ground Productions because, you know, we're going into the hard ground. We're breaking up the fallow ground. That was our whole attitude. So we took this, as the ish, this approach as a family. We're going to live missionally in Hollywood. Uh, we're not going to isolate from it. We're going to infiltrate in the name of Jesus. Now, there's, there's a, there's a three-part kind of concept that goes along with that. Um, and, and this is uh, accept, reject, or redeem. And, and, you know, when we as Christians are engaged in the world and we encounter various things, we have, we have three choices. The things that we encounter, we can accept, or the things that we encounter, we can reject, or the things that we encounter, we can redeem. For example, as a church, you know, 
Halloween is, is horribly pagan. Pagan roots, uh, it just, it just, it's wicked, it's evil. And, and so I hate Halloween. I can't stand it. Everything in me wants to reject Halloween, right? And there, there are people that are on the other opposite end of the, the spectrum. They absolutely accept Halloween. They love it. They embrace it. Hey, this is great. And, uh, and, but yet, you'll see some churches that will say, you know what? We're going to redeem that. We're going we're gonna to do a harvest festival on Halloween night. We're going to pre preach the gospel. We're going to bring the kids together uh, and so on. You know, a silly example, but, but a good example. And so, you know, Paul, as he goes into these major cities, he's dealing with, with, with this whole concept. It's like, am I going to isolate? Am I going to get in my Christian bubble and just isolate from the world? No, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to infiltrate the world. Not to become like the world, not to conform to the world. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, but, but we are to, uh, to infiltrate. And as we infiltrate, and as we encounter culture, and as we encounter people, and as we encounter the world's systems and structures and policies and all of this stuff, we make this constant choice. Accept it, reject it, or redeem it. And there are some things that we just have to reject outright. And there are also some things that we can accept. And there are many things that we can redeem. But notice here in verse 12 that Paul and his team, they didn't immediately venture into the city to evangelize it. Notice again, it says they get to Sydney and we were staying in that city for some days. It seems to suggest... They weren't actively engaging. They didn't get right to work. They're staying for, for, some, for some days. Um, you would think, given Paul's nature, if you've met him in the scriptures, Paul is somebody that, you know, he, he's, he's a worker. You know, he's a let's get it done kind of guy, you know. Let's not, do, why, why are we gonna talk about it? Let's do it. You know, that's Paul. Um, and so, you know, you think he'd be anxious to get started, it is very possible when we consider why. Why didn't they get started? It, it, it's very possible what they did was they spent this time waiting upon God. In fact, Warren Wearsby, he, he, uh, he gives a very plausible reason for why Paul waited. And this is a huge point of application for us. Um, here's, here's what Warren Wearsby said. He says, it's not enough to know where God wants us to work. We must also know when and how. He wants us to work, right? Paul tried to go two different places before he got the green light through the vision. Hey, come to Macedonia. Oh, okay, the where, in a large sense, is, is answered, right? I want you to go to Europe. Okay, well, Europe's a big place. Where specifically? He's got to get that figured out. And, and then when and how? Like, what, you know, what's this supposed to look like? Now, understand, this is true not just in ministry, but this concept is true in every endeavor that you and I commit to. Why? Because all of our life is ministry unto the Lord. Everything that we do is ministry unto the Lord. And where we go is just one part of the equation that we have to consider. Turn over to, uh, to the book of Ruth real quick. Uh, book of Ruth is in your Old Testament. It's like, what is it, the eighth verse or the eighth book? Genesis, Exodus, Luke, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, John. It's the eighth book, Ruth. Um, we're talking about, you know, gosh, where do we go? When do we go? Uh, how are we supposed to do this? this the, all of these things. Now, check this guy out. It says in Ruth chapter one. <clears throat> now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. In the days when the judges ruled, that's, a, that's, that's kind of like a big old beacon, highlight to us, to clue us in on what kind of days these were. Uh, I'll give you this descriptor of the book of Judges. Um, there are seven distinct cycles in the book of Judges of sin to salvation, right? And it shows us there how Israel had set aside God's law 
And in its place, they substituted what was right in their own eyes. They go through this cycle seven times. They do what's right in their own eyes. It leads to train wreck. And then how God, through you know, regime change and stuff, brings about righteousness again and so on. So this is the backdrop of this story, right? Um, it's the days when people are doing what's right in their own eyes. Uh, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, by the way, means the house of bread, which is going to become ironic in a minute. Uh, a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. Now, Moab is enemy territory. Jews were not supposed to go into enemy territory. And so, so we start off seeing a guy going into enemy territory. Why? He and his wife and his two sons, and they went to, to dwell there. They didn't go there to do battle. They went to live. And the name of the man was Elimelech. It means God is king. The name of his wife was Naomi, which means pleasant. She'll become bitter by the end of the story. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion, uh, which basically means sick and dying. Who names their kids sick and dying, right? The guy who, well, he's got his king, but God isn't his king anymore, right? That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what's going down here. And then Elimelech, God is king, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons, and now they took wives of the women of Moab. Right? Were, were Jews supposed to marry Moabite women? No. But what other choice did they have? Their dad moved them into a place where it's like the dating pool is 100% Moabite women. Like, what else is going to happen there? And it gives us the name of the gals that they married and so on. Here's my point. We're talking about this idea of knowing where to go, when to go, and, and how all this is supposed to go down. And what, what, uh, what Elimelech does is he decides, well, I'm here in the house of bread, but there ain't no bread, and there's bread in Moab. So, so I guess that I'll go to Moab. Now, was that in God's will or was that outside of God's will? It was outside of God's will. And what was Elimelech doing? He's walking by sight. He's figuring out everything in his own head. Like, where, how can, pro, and for Elimelech, it's like this. Everything is problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. I'm going to manage this. I'm going to control this, right? And, and here's the point of application for us. We got to ask this question. Am I waiting on God? Am I seeking his where, when, and hows? Or am I impulsive and self-reliant? Now listen, some of us need to stop right there and take a walk with that. Listen, I get it. Like I'm at the front of this line so many times to my shame to where I'm like, I've heard from God. I got all the answers. Like, you know, I, I don't want any input. I, I don't want to hear a differing opinion, right? I've, I, I'm going to trust in my own opinion. I'm going to trust in my own plan. But listen, every time that I have done that, Every time I've trusted in myself, every time I've rejected godly counsel, every time I've failed to listen to God, I've regretted it. Just profound regret. And so, so in our text, what we're seeing is Paul gets there, but he doesn't get right to work. He's waiting on the Lord is what he's doing. And, and you know, God's given him a vision. We're going in this direction, but God, you know, what are you up to? Notice what else Paul does in verse 13. He goes to church. Verse 13, it says, On the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customly made, and we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. Now, right, I would submit to you that church is a great place to seek God for the where, when, and hows of your life. Church is a great place to seek, the God, to seek God for the where, when, and hows of your life. And you're like, well, wait a minute, I don't read about a church. I read about them going to the riverside. Yeah, we'll unpack that in a half a second here. But listen, understand God's custom, not only would he go to the cities, or uh, Paul's custom was not only would he go to the cities when, when he's on a missionary endeavor, but he'd also go first to the Jews. And, uh, and you know, always seeking to evangelize the Jews. Why? Because the Christ was the son of David and the hope of the Messiah had long been held by the Jews. 
And so when the gospel of Christ was first proclaimed, the Jews had priority. The Bible tells us that. And so we see this prioritization in uh, Paul's first missionary journey. Every time they came to a new city, Paul and Barnabas would first preach in the synagogue to the Jews in that day. But here in Philippi, there's no synagogue. How do we know that? Because they went to the riverside. See, when they went to the river to meet for prayer, this was following Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition uh, worked this way, that when, uh, when there was a city, there had to be at least 10 men in that city in order for them to build a synagogue. And if they didn't have at least 10 men in that city, then they would have to alternatively meet by a, a flowing river um, to worship the Lord and go for prayer and so on. And so that's what we see here. So that tells us there's not 10 Jewish men uh, there in the city of Philippi. And, and as a matter of fact, not only don't they have 10 men, they don't have any men, right? It's all women. And, and unfortunately, the attitude of the rabbis in this day regarding women wasn't exactly progressive. This was actually a quote of the rabbis of the day. They said, it's better that the words of the law be burned than to be delivered to a woman. Right? That was this, this attitude. But Paul here, he's armed with a godly where, when, and how because he's waited upon the Lord. And he understands that the gospel's for everyone. That as it turns out, the serpent's bite doesn't distinguish between men and women. And he's got the antidote. Right, And so verse 13 says, they sat down and they spoke to the women who met there. And verse 14 tells us what they talked about. They talked about the gospel. Here, here it is. Uh, he says in verse 13, we, we went out of the city of the riverside where prayer was customly made. We sat down, we spoke to the women who met there. And now verse 14 says, a certain woman named Lydia heard us she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And so what that tells us there is she's, she's hearing the word of God. And so this is what Paul was speaking about with those gals that are, that are gathered. And she, uh, uh, and when she, verse 15, and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. Now, let's hit the pause button right here. And, it, and just, it, let's kind of summarize. We, we, we summarize Acts 16 so far. Uh, what we see is how God led Paul and his team in their proclamation of the gospel, right? He led them through a series of no's, telling them where not to go. He led them in by an emphatic go, giving Paul a, a vision, imploring him where to go. And he led them through a time of waiting uh, on the when and the how to go, right? Now, here now what we see is uh, transitioning from how God led Paul and his team in their proclamation of the gospel. Now what we're looking at is how God led Paul and his team through the various responses to the gospel. And it starts here with the response of Lydia. Now, I want to highlight in what we've just read um, two interesting details and then two very important details. Uh, first interesting detail we see is that she was a seller of purple. Now, to put that in modern terms, it would be like saying that she was a seller of Armani or she was a seller of Prada, right? She was, she was dealing in high-end, valuable stuff, right? Which tells us she's probably very wealthy, right? And, and, and understand, purple dye was insanely pricey. Um, the reason why is because they, they had to get it uh, it was obtained by a murex sea snail. It's got a, a really gorgeous uh, shell. If you look at the, sh the shell, it's kind of one of these ones that has the, the bulbous part on the top and the long tail and the little spiny things that come out from it. Have you ever seen those, those seashells? That's a murex uh, sea snail. 
And, uh, and in order for them, according to Roman author Pliny the Elder, um, he, he says that thousands of snails were needed to produce just one ounce of dye. So, so it, it, was, it was in, you know, not, it was in uh, reserved commodity, you know? So that's the first interesting thing. Nothing really significant about that other than to say, wow, look at that. I, I guess it's also interesting. I found that, that the, uh, the high priest, his garment, had this, this dye in his, in his garment. So I don't know. Again, interesting. It's probably some sort of spiritual connection there. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Anyway, second interesting detail. I, I give you some of this just because, you know, I geek out on some of this stuff. But Anyway, second interesting detail about Lydia was that she's from the city of Thyatira. That's what the text tells us. Um, Thyatira was the epicenter of the purple dye sellers for whatever reason. It's inland, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But this is where, you know, the Mecca of, you know, I don't, I don't know, think of an industry, you know, I guess Hollywood, you would say, is the Mecca of film production. And so Thyatira was the, the, the epicenter of purple dye sellers. And it was actually located, Thyatira was, back in Asia Minor, where Paul had just come from. And, and it, so it's kind of ironic, right? Because Paul received this vision of a Macedonian man and his, in, in you know, Macedonia in Europe, and yet his first convert isn't a Macedonian, it's not a man from Macedonia, it's a woman from Asia Minor, it's just crazy, right? But she would be the first of a great harvest of Christians and churches in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Corinth, in Ephesus, and many, many more places within the European continent, right? And just those four churches alone that I just mentioned, they would inspire six entire books of the New Testament. And so, here, just like at Jesus' tomb, God uses women to receive and to spread the gospel message. And we see also with this woman, Lydia, two very important details. Not just these interesting geek out details, but we see very important details uh, in verse 14 related to her conversion. First of all, notice that verse 14 tells us she worshiped God. Now, what that means is not that she had come to know Christ as her Messiah. What that means is this was a Gentile woman who was actively seeking God. And because of the way that God had worked through the nation of Israel, which was his intent all along to cause the other nations to come to know God. And so because of, of that, she had said, well, if I'm gonna seek God, I, I guess I should follow the Hebrew practices and start praying and, and seeking their God. This is kind of the idea. And so she's a woman who's actively seeking God. And I always like to say this, that, that those who, you know, people, they're, they're always worried about like, oh, what, this notion of if you don't receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell, then, you know, what about the, the, what about the, the, the guy in Africa who, who, who never hears the, the, the gospel? And, you know, we got this great story in the book of Acts of, of, you know, God sending a man. There was a man from Ethiopia. He went to, Jer to, to Jerusalem, the, the story says, and he was seeking after the Lord. And here he's headed home. He's, he's taken his money and he's bought a scroll of Isaiah. No small expenditure, but he still hasn't found God. He's going home just as empty as he came, but he was on a hunger and, and a quest for God. We know that because he went to the trouble of buying very, you know, buying this, this book from, of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading it. And God sends Philip to him. And, uh, and Philip's got, I mean, he's pastoring Calvary Chapel, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, in Jerusalem there. It's just, it's going off the hook. And uh, God tells him in the middle of it, he's like, hey, I, time to go. I'm, I want you, I'm gonna send you down to the desert. He goes to the desert to one man. It's the Ethiopian eunuch, man from Africa, who's seeking God. And he leads him to the Lord. So here's a woman, she's seeking God. Maybe that describes you today. 
right? Isaiah, the prophet says this, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Second uh, really important thing I want you to notice is that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. That's what the text says. The Lord opened her heart. Jesus said this. He said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And now this promise, I will raise him up the last day. See, and, and here's the thing that stands out to me. It appears as you read through the story here that Paul and his companions, they weren't even speaking to Lydia directly. It would appear they were talking to her friends or to the people that she worshiped with. <coughs> and uh, they're, uh, they're listening. She's overhearing and listening to the things that they're saying. Absolutely fascinating thing uh, to consider here. Um, and I want you to consider how the promises of God in Isaiah chapter 55 and in John chapter 6, how they go hand in hand. Because in Isaiah 55, there's this plea and there's this promise of God. Seek the Lord while he, he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And the, the promise that God gives is... Uh, I'm gonna, I'll pardon that guy, right? And, and then in John 6, you know, you've got not a plea and a promise, but you've got power and a promise where Jesus says this, no one can come to me except for the Father draws him. There's power there, right? And, and, and the promise, I'm gonna raise him up at the last day. And you put both of these together and it's kind of a both and that, that we have the burden and the imploring of God, seek him. And God, on his part, he's going to draw you to himself. He's going to reveal himself to you. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. And I just want to point out, maybe you, you might be here today and God has been drawing you. Maybe for you, it's been a matter of God working and drawing. Maybe that's why you're here today, to hear the gospel. Maybe, you know, you, you're in a situation or have been in a situation where you weren't, somebody wasn't even talking to you, but you were hungry and thirsty for the things of God. It's like, man, I, I, need, I need that. I need, I, I need what they're talking about. You, God might, might have drawn you here today. And, and I'm going to give you an invitation at the end of the message to pray and to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to receive him. Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And, and, and no one comes to the Father except for that the Spirit draws him. I wonder if the Spirit's drawing you today. I want you to notice in verse 15 that Lydia and her household, um, their faith is evidenced by, by what happens. They affirm their faith uh, through, through baptism. Here's what it says. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful, Lord, come, stay at my house. And so she persuaded us. Uh, two quick things about that. First of all, there's gotta be evidence in your life of true conversion. The Bible speaks about this in James chapter two. It talks to us there about how faith without works is dead. And, and the idea is this. It's, it's that, you know, faith and works, they go together, but it, it's not of my works earn some sort of right standing with God. It's not like that at all. It's that what your works do is that they testify that your faith is true. There's a, there, there, there's a, there, they serve as an evidence that, that there's something that's, that's happened in your life. And in, in Lydia's example, and the example of those in her household, the evidence is baptism. 
This is, this is the evidence. Let me, let me see a show of hands. How many of y'all have been baptized? Show of hands. Okay, praise the Lord. Um, those of you that raise your hands, you understand baptism is an outward sign of an inward change, right? What we do is we, when we're baptized, the going under the water symbolizes death. Coming up out of the water symbolizes resurrection, new life, right? And, um, and again, going into the water, death and burial, right? That's the idea, resurrection. And what we're doing is we're, we are symbolizing the death and burial of Jesus Christ and his resurrection to newness of life and his promise that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. This is what, what baptism is. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an outward sign of an inward change. It's a public declaration to tell everybody, I am a follower of Jesus, right? And we see examples of this abounding in scripture. Think about Acts chapter two. It, the, it's Pentecost, the day of the birth of the church. Peter's preaching the gospel. Thousands of people are responding, getting saved. Here's what it says. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then those who gladly received his word, here it is, were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. That was a long baptism, right? Now, again, in Acts chapter eight, I told you a story about Philip. God sends him to the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And, and listen to his story. It says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, um, it's talking about, you know, God told, the spirit of God told Philip, go run down by the chariot. That guy's reading, listen in, and he's listening in and he's reading the words of Isaiah. And so beginning at this scripture, Philip preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Listen, this is an outward sign of an inward change. This is uh, Lydia and her household going, you know what, we're, we're believers, now we're gonna be baptized. By the way, we have a baptism coming up on Easter. It's already packed. Um, we probably have 50 people getting baptized already. But, um, but if you have not been baptized, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we're commanded in scripture that we should do this, right? And uh, I would tell you, what's you know, this is an evidence of your faith. This is a testimony of your faith. And it's something the Bible tells you to do. Not to earn your salvation, but it, it should be the product of your salvation. And in these examples, biblically, it's the very first thing they did as believers. I'm gonna go get baptized. So sign up if you haven't been signed up to, to baptize already. Um, and the people that are irritated me for the, you know, I'm gonna overwhelm everybody on Easter. It's okay, we'll, we'll stay here as long as you want. We'll baptize you. Um, all right, so let's wrap it up. Lydia and her household, they're baptized. And now she says, come and stay at my house. Now, this is more than a place to sleep. It's a place to launch. Lydia's house is gonna become the launching pad for the church in Philippi. God's gonna do an incredible work. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to kind of point out this scenario because it's a great transition to where we're gonna go next week. Um, you see it in, uh, in Luke's gospel. Uh, God, it, well, I'll just read it to you. It says, the Lord appointed 72 others and he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't take a, a, a purse or bag or sandals. Don't greet anybody on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. And if somebody who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it'll return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. This is the dynamic that's happening here that we're reading about. Lydia says, come to my house. I want to host you. Right, it's exactly what Jesus was talking about to these people he sent out. He said, I wanna go out and do a work and the towns where I'm gonna go work, 
I'm going to send you all to it. And this is what he's done with Paul and all his guys. And I'm going to send you to do this work. And you know what? You're going to encounter people. Some will reject you. But you know what? Some are going to open their house wide open. Go in and, and get to work. And, and so, again, Jesus speaking to the 70 that he sent out. When you enter a town and are welcome to eat what's offered to you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But... When you enter a town and are not welcome to go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. And Jesus said, be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. So this is the, this is the scenario that's unfolding here. It's exactly what Jesus had done with the 70. It's exactly what he's doing here. And so on the one hand, you've got Lydia and her house. They're responding to it. She throws wide open the door of her house, begs them to come stay, says, look, this is going to be a launching pad for your work. And, uh, and no doubt she bankrolls it because she's a wealthy woman, right? But some in the town are going to fail to, uh, they're going to fall into this latter category that Jesus described, and they're going to reject the gospel, and it's going to be a party. We'll, we'll, we'll see that next week. But Four questions as we close for you. Uh, number one, I want you to take a walk with this. How can the concept of accept, reject, redeem uh, inform my conduct as a follower of Christ and as an ambassador to the lost? Second question, ask yourself this. Am I waiting on God, seeking his where, when, and hows, or am I impulsive and self-reliant? And a little bonus question for that one. What are some safeguards that I can employ to guard me from impulsiveness and self-reliance? For some of y'all, that's, that's why you're here today, to, to kind of take a walk with that question. Third question, have I been obedient to the Lord to be baptized? That's an easy fix. Sign up out in the, the foyer on your way out today. Be baptized if you, if you haven't already. Um, and number four, is the Lord opening my heart to heed the gospel? And am, am I ready to respond to his invitation? And this is where we'll close in prayer.